Excellent. What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. Today's video is about the best CPU for gaming. And I've done this type of video before, and it's very important at the beginning of any video where you talk about the best CPU for gaming, to phrase exactly the terms by which you are defining what you mean. And what I'm talking about today is what I mean not only just for me, but also for any of you guys who are curious what a GTX 1080 Ti SLI configuration uh, needs in order to get the most frames per second out of the amount of GPU horsepower that's available there. Because let's face it, right now, within reason, as far as what's supported from the driver's side, from NVIDIA as well as game developers, as well as what you can feasibly drop into a system and just start gaming with, uh, GTX 1080 Ti and two-way SLI is about as high-end as you can go. Yes, you can go three-way or four-way, but you're not going to have the driver support. You're not going to be able to actually get any benefit out of games. So there it is, and that's why I'm going with this configuration. Second reason is, of course, that I am currently in progress of getting all the parts decided upon for my special water cooling build, the resurrection of Arctic Panther, uh, the water cooled system that I originally built a couple years ago. I'm going to be refreshing it and updating it with two GTX 1080 Ti's and I wanted to see what else I should put in there to make sure that I get the most bang for buck out of them. This is going to be a gaming specific system so I'm not as concerned about doing other stuff although gaming and streaming at the same time might be a consideration and that's definitely something to keep in mind for later on. All that said though, apart from my two graphics cards, two Asus Strix GTX 1080 Ti 11 gig graphics cards, what else is the rest of the hardware that I'm working with today? Because I actually have three different test beds that I'm going to be testing this out on, as well as four different CPUs. So our first test bed houses our Intel Core i7-7700K, which uh, most people will tell you is the best CPU for gaming right now when it comes to pure gaming. And I've wanted to, again, give all the CPUs a really good chance at doing the best they can. So I have a water cooling setup. This is just a Corsair H110, 280 millimeter closed loop cooler, uh, kept everything nice and chilly. And I originally had this CPU, I'm able to get this CPU to 4.9 gigahertz, at least during the winter months, but since it is a few degrees warmer here in the summer, it was giving me a little bit of instability at 4.9, so I ended up dialing it back to 4.8 gigahertz on the CPU. For memory, I'm running 8 gigabyte DIMMs pretty much and everything, so this is a 2 by 8 gigabyte uh, configuration, uh, Kingston HyperX Predator memory, and I'm running all the memory at 3200 speed. Uh, this one is running at cast latency 15, which is just ever so slightly uh, looser timings than the other memory kits, which are at CL14. So that is one slight difference between the test beds, but as you'll probably see coming up very soon, uh, didn't really impact the benchmark numbers from what I could tell. For SSDs, I have all the systems on NVMe SSDs. This one's on an Intel 600P series. NVMe SSD that has uh, the operating system on it and that pretty much rounds things out except for the motherboard which is the Gigabyte Aorus Z270X Gaming 7 and then the uh, power supply is a Rosewell 1000 watt 80 plus platinum rated unit. For our Ryzen test bed, we have this setup right over here. Of course, uh, Ryzen 7 1800X is the CPU, 8 cores, running at 4 GHz and being cooled by the Corsair H100i V2 closed loop CPU cooler. That's a 240 millimeter all in one unit. Uh, the motherboard, of course, is the old school, well, I don't want to say old school, but the old standby, the Crosshair 6 Hero that I've done a lot of testing with Ryzen with. Uh, the memory is sort of tucked away in there and uh, also one that I've done a decent amount of testing with with Ryzen, the G-Skill Flare X kit that is made specifically to play nice with Ryzen at higher frequencies. Again, that is a 2x8 gig kit and I'm running it at 3200 speed. This one's a cast latency 14. For storage, there's a Patriot Hellfire 480 gig NVMe SSD. Uh, please ignore the graphics card that's currently on there. Of course, all the testing was done with the two-way 1080 Ti's. And finally, just in case you're wondering, that is a Lian Li PCT60 test bed, and the power supply is a Corsair HX1000i. And finally, over here on the Praxis wet bench, we have our final test bed. And this one's probably where most of the focus is, at least as far as what the game performance is going to be. This is an X299 test bed. It is based on the MSI Gaming M7 ACK X299 motherboard down there, sort of holding everything together and also handling the overclock, which is doing a pretty good job with so far. The 7740X that is currently installed there has been overclocked to 5.1 GHz. It's actually running at about 5. 
1025 gigahertz to be more specific and it's kept cool by the fractal uh, Kelvin 360 uh, it's actually the 360 millimeter version of their liquid cooler um, you can only really see the the pump part of it right there with the tubing and everything on it but uh, there it is for the memory kits again I have 8 gig dims when it's in the uh, 7740x configuration it's just gonna have two 8 gig dims that are currently lit up over here on this side again running at 3200 speed cast latency 14 uh, and then when I pop in the uh, the 7820x then it will give me quad channel and then I'll have uh, four by eight gig dims and they'll all light up which which will sure be nice as for an SSD this one is running on an OCZ RD 400 NVMe 512 gig SSD although it is uh, completely covered up by the graphics cards down there at the bottom so you can't really see it right now uh, the test bit it's sitting on, of course, is the Praxis wet, be wet Bench, and then for a power supply, I have the uh, Gigabyte Extreme Gaming 1200 watt 80 plus platinum rated, uh, given everything the juice it needs to power the games. And then my final testing configuration, which is this same X299 test bed, but this time instead of the 7740X, I have swapped in the 7820X, which is the 8 core 16 thread Skylake X CPU. The reason I chose this one is because it seems to be the most viable option for me to use in my water-cooled system. And basically, I might have tried the 6-core, or of course I got the 10-core as well, but I'm trying to find the best suitable candidate for this purpose, and I wanted something I could overclock decently. And once you get up to the higher core counts, it becomes more difficult to overclock. But I was able to overclock the 7820X to 4.6 gigahertz, um, which I think will give it a decent amount of extra headroom when it comes to the gaming performance when compared to something like the 7740X. But I still don't have high, high hopes because typically with gaming, uh, frequency is still king. And so I'm guessing that the 7740X is going to still come out on top. Let's get into my actual overclocking and testing configuration though. I've already mentioned all the CPUs and the test beds that I'm running on and the overclocks for the CPUs. The graphics cards I did overclock as well though, although not by much since these are already pre-overclocked ASUS Strix graphics cards. I uh, basically set the power limit, uh, this is with MSI Afterburner, Afterburner by the way, set the power limit to 120%, plus 45 on the core clock, plus 350 on the memory clock, uh, and I set this, the fan speed on both GPUs to static 60% just to help kick all of that warm air out. Just to reiterate, all the memory configurations I'm using with all the test beds are all running at 3200 speed, and then they're all at cast latency 14, except for that HyperX kit, um, which is in the Z270 test bed, that's at cast latency 15, which uh, hopefully shouldn't affect things too much. All the tests I'm running, as far as the benchmarks you're going to see today, I chose specifically because they actually scale decently or pretty well when in an SLI 2GPU configuration. I was just figuring if I chose uh, games that didn't, that wouldn't make much sense since I'm testing SLI, so that's why I chose the games I did. And if you want to check out some of the reviews that I researched prior to this video, I posted some links to those down in the description below. All that said, at long last, here are all of my benchmarks. Okay guys, all of those charts represent a lot of work, so I hope you have looked at all of those numbers very carefully. Uh, I have, certainly, because I'm trying to make a decision based on them. So first off, if you want to look at those synthetic benchmarks, the 3 d Mark ones, for example, they might initially seem to indicate that one of the CPU platforms is doing better than the others. However, bear in mind that those synthetic benchmarks tend to weigh in stuff like raw CPU performance a lot more. They have physics-based tests that CPUs with higher core counts tend to do very well at, so that's where you might see some of that variance. If you actually look at the GPU scores on those tests, you'll notice there's only about a 1 to 200 point difference between each of the four platforms using this same GPU configuration. Now specifically comparing the Kaby Lake CPUs, the Kaby Lake X7740X and the Kaby Lake 7700K, 
The KB Lake X had about a 300 megahertz uh, frequency advantage since it was running at 5.1 gigahertz versus 7700K running at 4.8 gigahertz. Now, tests that have been done over the past month or two that I've been surprised at have shown the 7700K beating the 7740X in a lot of situations, and that might actually be the case if you're setting up a very CPU limited circumstance, such as testing uh, games at 1080. Now, I look at this both ways because testing games at 1080 is a very good way to put the burden on the CPU and to get more information about which CPUs are performing better. However, when it comes to a real world, real world situation, the chances of somebody purchasing two 1080 Ti's and running them in SLI and then playing games at 1080 is pretty slim, or at least you're not investing your money in the most effective way. You should get one 1080 Ti and then spend the other money on a, on a better monitor is what you should probably do. So. That's why I did these tests in this way, is to be a little bit more real world and say, for what I'm actually going to be using these GPUs for, what is going to give the best performance? And in the end, with that frequency advantage, the 7740X actually seems to outperform the 7700K, at least in these tests that I tried today. So, it does seem like it is viable in that regard. However, I only tested this because I was thinking if there was going to be some huge disproportionate change with the 7740X that I might actually consider using it. But it's very minimal and I don't think the sacrifices you have to make with, when going with KB Lake X, the additional costs you have to spend on the motherboard, the lack of the ability to use quad channel memory, the lack of the ability to access a lot of the stuff that's on a high-end X299 motherboard, just doesn't make it worth the cost. Now as for my 1800X system back here, I was actually quite impressed with its performance. We saw some pretty significant de deficits when testing Ryzen when it initially launched, but there have been a lot of updates uh, when it comes to BIOS rollouts, the AGISA updates, as well as memory compatibility, as well as updates to Windows and some of the games that have been patched to improve performance there as well. However, across the board, the 1800X system still did lag behind all of the other Intel-based systems that I tested today. Even if it was minimal, I would say that if I was looking purely at a what's the best price to performance option here, I'm pretty much sure that the Ryzen system would win. However, since the cost is less of a concern with this particular demonstration, I'm looking more towards what is the best option. I have to say I'm probably not going to do a Ryzen based build for the next version of Arctic Panther. Now, the 7700K did very well today, and if I was choosing an all-around winner when it comes to both the price and the performance, that's probably what I would choose, because you don't have to spend a lot of money on the motherboard, you get really good performance, you can overclock, as long as you're not gonna be streaming, because the 7700K does have a performance deficit when it comes to streaming, especially when you're comparing it to Ryzen 6 core and 8 core options, but if all you wanna do is play games, then the 7700K is still where it's at. But the 7820X is actually the CPU from all this testing that I'm leaning towards the most for a few different reasons. First off, it overclocked pretty easily, hit 4.6 gigahertz. Granted, I couldn't go much beyond that, but uh, that's about what I was expecting when it comes to eight core CPU offerings from Intel right now. Second, if I am gonna be using this in a new liquid cooled system build and I'm comparing it to the previous version, which featured an eight core 50, uh, 5960X, as well as quad channel memory, it was an enthusiast platform system build, it would seem like a little bit of a, of a downgrade to switch to the mainstream and to lose out on stuff like quad channel memory and that kind of thing. I know I'm not speaking from, the, from a practical standpoint or perspective, I'm speaking from the enthusiast perspective where I just want things to be good and fast and everything. Of course, you can critique me there, because if I was really going for the enthusiast perspective, I would just put the uh, 7900X in there and call it a day. But the 7900X does run very hot, and even hotter when you attempt to overclock it, since it has a uh, 10 cores. So I'm thinking the 8 cores as sort of an in-between, still seems like an upgrade, still gets most of the gaming performance, if not that last few percentage points that you might be able to get with the 7700K or 7740X. I'm thinking that seems like possibly the most reasonable, if reasonable can be a word when describing this type of build, solution. But I, of course, am very curious to hear what you guys think. I always like taking your feedback into consideration. So please leave me comments in the comment section down below and let me know what you think of these numbers that I have gathered over the past few days and all of my benchmark testing. Now, I can't end this video without at least quickly mentioning Threadripper because it's only couple weeks uh, away from launch uh, according to what AMD has told us and there's a ton of people who are going to be like ah just just wait and build a Threadripper system. First off 
I'm not expecting gaming specific performance on Threadripper to be any better than it is on Ryzen. It's using the same architecture, it's using the same CPU cores, it's still going to be viable, it's still going to be good, it's still probably going to be a really excellent price to performance option, but I'm not expecting it to suddenly leapfrog the Intel chips to provide better gaming performance. Also, who's to say I'm not going to build a Threadripper water-cooled system too? I'm probably going to do that as well. It's just probably not going to be this system that I'm planning to build right now. So stay tuned for that. It will be coming soon. I've got Ryzen 3 coming up, got Threadripper hopefully uh, soon after that, and I've of course got this build that I'm now ready to move on to the next step with. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed it, of course. I'll be back next week with more excellent content, as always, about the technologies, and I might even show my dogs off again. Thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.